Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? This is a program where we try to tie in every subject to the Bible because the Bible is the Word of God. It is the book that tells us all about ourselves and our relationship to God who created this universe. And it has many wonderful, wonderful things to tell us. Uh, for example, we read in the Psalms, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. Uh, if we recognize who the Lord is, that is Jehovah, that and uh, the Bible says, I, I am Jehovah, and beside me there is no Savior. That means that Jehovah is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we trust in him, uh, if we have come to recognize him as Savior uh, and uh, having the evidence being an intense desire to do his will, then we also... Uh, know that we have the blessing of God, and the blessing is the highest good possible, namely eternal life. That is what is one of the subjects. In fact, it is a major subject that the Bible speaks about because it is the answer to man's huge predicament in that we're sinners under the wrath of God. And yet, uh, for many who, who uh, God has plan to save it is a wonderful wonderful future for them but this is your program and we uh, spend this time in looking at anything and everything that the bible has to offer and so shall we take our first call tonight please good evening welcome to open forum good hello e yes good evening mr campaign yes good night sir could you tell me the scripture in the Bible that says the church age is over? Well, yes, there are many passages that relate to that. One of the passages is that in uh, Revelation chapter 11, it talks about uh, the gospel going out throughout the New Testament era, and, uh, and then the two witnesses representing those who are bringing the gospel. Please turn your radio off because we're getting some feedback. Those who... Uh, uh, who uh, are sending out the gospel are killed uh, and uh, because God is saying their work is finished. God has finished with their work. And so it is, uh, it is uh, uh, a time of great tribulation consequently. And then God indicates that there is a, uh, the latter rain or a second jubilee a second time for the final harvest of those who are to become safe. Now, this subject is very com complex. It is uh, covered in many, many parts of the Bible. And uh, therefore, uh, Family Radio has prepared two books that relate to this. One is uh, entitled The End of the Church Age and After. And the other book is entitled Wheat and Tares. Both are free. All you have to do is uh, call our Right Family Radio, and they will all be sent to you free. And uh, uh, by looking at them, you can discover all of the verses in the Bible that relate to this awesome and terrible subject of the end of the church age, and yet at the same time relate to the fact that God has a marvelous plan today to continue to bring the gospel outside by those who are outside of the local churches. But shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome. Hello. Yes. Yes, go ahead with your call. Oh, my, we lost that call. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. The number to call, incidentally, is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385.
And shall we go to our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Hello. Yes, good evening. Yes. Brother Camping, last night there was a call regarding Genesis 1, 2, 3, and 4, I believe. Yes. And I missed a lot of it, but it was extremely in interesting and informative. And I wondered if you would uh, kindly expound on that again. Well, yes, you see, uh, uh, let me just outline that a moment. You know, in in uh, Genesis chapter 1, God shows that in six days, and we know there are six days, which are 24 hours long, just like uh, days that we have today, uh, God created the whole universe. However, because God anticipated the fact that mankind would rebel, before he even created the world, he already put in place his whole, uh, worked out in detail, his whole salvation plan. Uh, the Bible speaks of every uh, one who would become saved having been chosen by God before the foundation of the world. And everyone, and Christ being the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. That's only possible because Christ is the great I am. He is, uh, whatever he is doing at any moment uh, covers all of time. He is the ever-present one. We don't understand that, of course, but we know that's what the Bible teaches. Then, in, as he created the world, right in the action of creating, he made that historical event, and it was a real historical event, as he said, let there be light on the first day, and as he brought forth the vegetation on the third day, and as he created the, uh, the, uh, the celestial clock, the sun, moon, and, star, and stars, and uh, uh, planets on the fourth day, and so on. The, uh, but as he did that, he did it in a way so that spiritually they were already demonstrating what his salvation plan was. And so therefore, on the first day, he went through a fairly convoluted uh, action. He, uh, we read that the earth was without form and void. That is, it was empty and, uh, and totally uh, uh, without any order of any kind. And, and it's the language of what hell will be, that uh, later on God speaks of hell with that kind of language. And darkness was on the face of the deep, and darkness has to do with the absence of the gospel. It is, uh, uh, mankind is in spiritual darkness before they are saved. And then it said that the Spirit brooded upon the face of the waters, and the Holy Spirit is uh, the one who finally does the saving, uh, applies the word of God to those who do become saved. The waters have to do with the peoples of the world who uh, uh, are, uh, uh, who are uh, for whom Christ came to save. And then we read, God said, let there be light. And the gospel shines out in this world of, of spiritual darkness, of spiritual sin, of people being under the wrath of God, and, and the possibility of, of salvation exists because Christ came as the light of the world. So all of this is a historical action by God in which he is... Uh, spiritually, uh, uh, metaphorically demonstrating what his salvation plan will be. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, good evening. Oh, uh, yes. Um, I wanted to ask you a question, uh, and I'd like to take my answer off the air, uh, in regard to hell and eternal fire and uh, could you refer me to maybe one or two scriptures in the Bible that would um, explain to a friend of mine who might be listening that uh, that hell is, is something that it goes on forever. 
Well, and uh, I'd like to take my call off the air. Thank you very much. Well, yes, you know, the Bible talks about hell as a lake of fire. And so those who read that say, well, then obviously those who are cast into hell will be quickly burned to a crisp and they'll cease to exist. What they fail to realize is, is that that is a figure of speech to indicate the awfulness of hell. It, it ties in with another verse in uh, Hebrews chapter, uh, let me see, Hebrews chapter 12, I believe it is, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 29, uh, Hebrews 13, verse 29, or no, 12, verse 29, I'm sorry, 12, verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. And so again, uh, they are assured, that they believe that, okay, then if we end up in hell, we, God will simply consume us with fire and we no longer exist. But on the other hand, uh, there are all kinds of passages that speak about hell as everlasting destruction. We read, uh, and this is a very, very uh, 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 important verse in this matter, uh, we read in, uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 11, as God is speaking about the uh, character of hell, and the wrath of God, and the smoke, this is Revelation 14, verse 11, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, that is, who are slaves of Satan, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Or again, in Revelation 21, or Revelation 22, it's talking there about uh, those who will be with Christ in heaven. We read in verse 14, Blessed are they, this is Revelation 22, verse 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without our, and, and the whole chapter incidentally is talking about the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, and then he says in verse 15, For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. And there are other passages of the same nature that indicate, yes, hell will go on forevermore. And uh, it is an awful, awful, awful thing to contemplate and that's why it's so imperative that we share the gospel with the world because Christ came to seek and to save those that he planned to save. But he does this by means of applying the gospel to the, their lives. And so we, have, as true believers, have been assigned the task to get the Bible out there into the world so that people can, can uh, uh, read it and hear it and be taught from it and God can apply that word to the hearts of those that he plans to save. Shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Campen, uh, the verse you were looking for last night was Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23. Jeremiah, let me read that a minute. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23. I beheld the mountains... Uh, 4, verse 23, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. Yes, that's the, that's the same uh, the same Hebrew words that we find in Genesis chapter 1, verse uh, 2, uh, and the earth was without form and void. Uh, here it is, is uh, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. And that is uh, speaking... Uh, the, the context shows that it is speaking about what hell will be like. Oh, hang yeah. up. And Thank you so much for sharing that. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. How are you? Yeah. I have a question on Matthew 4, verse 16. Matthew 4, verse 16. Let's look at that. Matthew 4, 
verse 16. There we read, uh, let's start out with verse 15, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the nations, of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death light is sprung up. Uh, and, and from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now what is your question? I wasn't sure what verse 16 means. Well, you see, uh, God here is is uh, uh, making reference to a prophecy that was made in Isaiah that's a very, very uh, difficult prophecy to understand. And now God is is indicating... Uh, please turn your radio off, okay? Okay, I'll uh, do that. Uh, God is, uh, is now uh, showing... Uh, what he had in mind as he uttered that prophecy uh, 800 or so years uh, earlier, uh, namely that that uh, uh, Galilee of the Gentiles is a reference to the whole world. The Gentiles or the nations refer to the whole world. And God is using the area of Israel of uh, that is... Uh, that, uh, had been inhabited by the uh, the uh, tribe of Zebulun and the tribe of Naphtali uh, as the uh, as a picture of the whole world, and now they have seen a great light. Why? Why? Because Christ is the light of the world. He has come, and it's explained in the next verse. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. The moment that we hear about Christ, we have the light shining on us, and and uh, we better listen carefully uh, because uh, that is the light of the gospel. Second question was just uh, regarding Samuel. I was reading your book, uh, Time Has an End, and it's an excellent book and recommend it to anyone who's listening. But uh, I was wondering, and Samuel, it appears, was a saved individual, but then uh, I noticed at the end of his life he was worshiping uh, strange gods. So I was wondering if he uh, was indeed a saved individual. Samuel? Sam yes. Sam no, not Samuel. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Solomon. Solomon, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, we wouldn't know that he was saved. In fact, you know, God speaks of a lot of individuals in the Old Testament. And uh, normally, we can't. T God does not give us any clear indication whether that person was saved or not saved. In a few cases, he does give us clear indication, but most of the time we uh, can only speculate. In the case of Moses, for example, or David, or um, uh, uh, Ebed Melek, or uh, and so on, we we know that they and Ruth the Moabites, Rahab the harlot, uh, Joshua, we know that they definitely were saved. On the other hand, a, a man like um, oh, like uh, uh, Solomon, we we w w might not know. Be, as we look at his life, we know that he in, got into pretty deep sin right at the end of his life. But because of a statement that God makes in the book of Nehemiah, I'm tr I'm going to turn to that a moment in uh, Nehemiah chapter uh, 13, we find there where God does tell us that Solomon indeed was saved. We read in, uh, in, uh, in Nehemiah chapter 13, mm, in verse 26, Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. So he did fall into sin, but God assures us that he, had, that he was a saved individual. And then my last logistical questions regarding the conference in Santa Cruz. I was just wondering if you know what 
what uh, topic you're going to discuss at the conference. I, well, was at I, the conference I, I know I haven't decided for sure what that will be yet. That's still uh, quite a ways away. Uh, we, uh, when we get, as I get closer, I'll, I'll be more certain about that. I'd rather not uh, and to say what it might be because it might not. I may change my mind between now and then. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, sir. Uh, I never liked church ever. I was wondering, was that a sin back in the day when it was the church age? You, uh, you, you, uh, would you repeat your question, please? I can barely hear you. Yeah, go ahead. I hear you okay. What, what was your question? Well... I never have liked church. Um, I just felt that my personal relationship with Christ was most, the most important, and I never really liked church. I was wondering if during the church age, was is, is that a sin not to go to church at that time? or? Yes, during the church age, God did command us to be under the, the uh, if at all possible, to be under the authority of elders and deacons, the spiritual oversight of elders and deacons and to come together as a congregation and that's why for many many decades as I have been teaching on this program I've encouraged again and again and again if you have become a true believer try to find a church that's reasonably true to the Word of God and become a member there uh, and that's why it was so hard to begin to teach a few years ago that now the church age has come to an end and you have to get out of the local congregation. Well, when I had my son, I, I figured I'd better go to church so I can instill the Word of God into him somehow. And uh, when I went there just recently, before I, I ever heard of family radio, this was a couple of years ago, uh, I tried a few churches and uh, I couldn't get him to go through the doors. And he... Uh, flat out refused and he, he even threw a fit saying that there's no God in there and and so I went by myself and found myself crying the whole time so what do you think of that? Well I don't know uh, you know uh, just because you're emotional and are crying as you go to uh, uh, that doesn't in, in itself prove anything I don't know what your heart is there are people who are very emotional and cry very easily there are people who are very stoic and uh, and uh, uh, in, faced with the same situation as the one who cries easily would never, never shed a tear. So we really can't tell a lot from that. And in fact, what happened in the past in your life is really not important. It's really not important. What is really important is where do you stand with Christ today? That's the question each of us have to ask. We have to examine ourselves, the Bible tells us to, to make sure that we are a child of God. And, uh, and if we have doubts about that, if we are not certain about that, uh, and remember the proof is that we have an intense desire to do the will of God, we love the Bible, and we, we are happiest when we do the will of God, or to say it the other way, we're very unhappy when we fall into a sin, uh, and if that isn't the condition of my life, then I, I am so thankful that I know that it's still the day of salvation, and maybe God will still save me, and I can begin to beg God for that salvation, and I can begin to read the Bible more diligently so that I might know more and more about God's plan. Can you read Ezekiel 37? Yes. Ezekiel 37 is a, is a uh, that's a fairly difficult uh, passage. Although the opening verses, as it talks about the Valley of Dry Bones, tells us, and that's that's uh, pretty plain. It's a parable, of course, but uh, but it is pretty plain that it's uh, telling us that God has to do all the work of saving us. If you read Ezekiel 34 and Ezekiel 36. Uh, these two chapters will also help you understand how God has to do all the work to save you. Can you read verse, thir uh, excuse me, chapter 37, verse 15 of Ezekiel? 
Uh, Ezekiel 37, verse 16. 15. 15. 15. Let's look at that a moment. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 16. 15. There, 15. The word of the Lord came. No, excuse me. Uh, yeah, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions, and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And this is simply talking about the fact that uh, when, uh, when uh, Christ is building the spiritual house of Israel, which was typified by the nations of Judah and Israel that, uh, that became separate nations upon the death of Solomon and were therefore uh, quite often fighting with each other and so on. But the, uh, they typified the, the true believers, uh, the house of Israel, and that is one stick. That is, uh, there is no uh, two compartments. It's, uh, God only has one Israel. And, uh, and David, my servant, is king over them, we read in verse 24. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we read in verse uh, 25, my servant David shall be their prince forever. It is talking about the eternal kingdom of God. In other words, that was typified externally by the uh, nations of Israel, which had become divided. But uh, thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Yes. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, sir. Um, I have two verses. The first one is in Matthew 4, verse 17. Matthew 4, and verse 17. Let's look at that one. Matthew 4, verse 17. We read... From that time, from, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, "Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand." And of course, uh, it was at hand because the King of the kingdom of heaven had come to go to the cross to pay for our sins. Hold on, just a minute. I'll be right back with you. We're continuing with the open forum, and we have a caller who's asked a question about a very interesting verse. Of course, every verse in the Bible is interesting, but uh, this verse says, From that time, this is Matthew 4, verse 17, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, bear in mind that the world now has been in existence about 11,000 years. During that 11,000 years, uh, the gospel has been a very small, had a very small impact upon the peoples of the world. Uh, there were times when, uh, in the days of Noah, for example, there were only eight individuals who were true believers. In the days of Abraham, uh, the number of true believers were probably just a handful. Uh, it was uh, hard to find anybody who was a true believer. We don't have any record in the Bible of others, although there may have been a few others, but it was very, very tiny. Even in the days of Israel, most of the time, uh, they uh, almost as an entire nation were in rebellion. For example, when they came out of Egypt, uh, as a nation of about two million people, most, almost all of them perished in the wilderness because of unbelief, uh, indicating they had not become saved. Then again, we have uh, uh, in the days of uh, Ahab uh, reigning in Israel, uh, they, they, Israel at that time could have been a nation of a million and a half or two million people, and there were only 7,000 out of that whole nation that had not bowed the knee to Baal, God said. And that's, that's like a third of 1%. It was a tiny, tiny uh, number. And these are the people who really had the gospel more than uh, most of the peoples of the world never even heard about Jehovah God. The Chinese had not at that time, as near as we can know. 
uh, the uh, 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 there were tiny remnants of nations that may have heard, but basically no. And uh, now g it was a time when God is on the threshold of sending the gospel into all the world. The kingdom is at hand, and it's going to be get sent out into the whole world. Remember the earlier verse 15, that uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Zebulun and Naphtali, uh, 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 representing the Galilee of the nations or the Gentiles, those people which sat in darkness saw great light. It was a statement. Now the gospel is going to be sent out. And a couple, a few years after this, Christ went back to heaven. And remember, on that first Pentecost day, as we read about it in Acts 2, there were about 3,000 who were saved. 3,000 in one afternoon. And uh, they were, were, came from 17 or 18 different nations. And, and that's the way it's been throughout the church age. The gospel has gone out into this area of the world and that area of the world and there have been a great multitude have, who have become saved and so this is uh, uh, w the import of this verse 17 that the kingdom of heaven is at hand and the nature of a true believer uh, or let's say the nature of someone who becomes a true believer is that he has repented now it isn't because he didn't become a true believer because he repented, but he, uh, because God made him a true believer, he repented because he was given a brand new resurrected soul which turned his life altogether around. Uh, before God had done that uh, enormous miracle in his life, he had been serving sin, serving himself, serving Satan, and then with a new resurrected soul he is only one desire in his soul essence and that is to serve to serve Christ and that uh, that is what ha will happen when God saves someone so when, when, when the Lord says repent for the kingdom of heaven is, is at hand is he saying this so that some will think they can work it out themselves but yet he's the one who has to do it is it like a trap or something like that. Yes, it is. It is somewhat of a snare. Uh, God uh, wrote the Bible so that those who are not reading the Bible uh, correctly and who are are uh, not uh, not trusting God all the way will read a verse like this and say, "Oh, I see. God commands me to repent. So I have been." Uh, uh, in the habit of cursing God, uh, and I'll not do that any longer. I have been in the habit of uh, of uh, th thinking immoral thoughts, and I'm going to quit doing that. I'm going to try to become far more moral than I was before. I was in the habit of what, whatever, this sin or that sin, I'm going to turn away from it. And they uh, desperately, uh, diligently work at that to try to turn away from this sin that they know about in their life and that sin and somehow believe that they are now on a path of salvation but the bible teaches that uh, that uh, we're spiritually dead and number spiritually dead number one number two unless we would uh, be able to turn away from every sin we uh, we uh, we still have to answer for our sins we need a savior someone who will pay for our sins and uh, so uh, the this is like the Old Testament uh, trap that God set for Israel, where he said in Deuteronomy 28, for example, if you obey me, if you obey me, then there will be wonderful blessings that will come upon you. And if you disobey, then there will be curses. Oh, well, then Israel said, we'll obey. And they so meticulous, therefore meticulously, and diligently kept all the ceremonial laws of burnt offerings and the seventh-day Sabbath and so on, trusting that now they had had uh, uh, are doing God's will. Therefore, they are uh, uh, well with God, or God looks upon them as His children. 
and yet God de declares to us in Romans chapter 9 that Israel, speaking about those people uh, of the Old Testament, Israel uh, sought for righteousness. They wanted righteousness, but they sought it without faith. That is, they sought it by works. If they could only be good enough, then God would look with mercy upon them, and you can't become good enough. And so they fell into the trap. They fell into the snare. What has to happen is we see this, repent. And we have to recognize, oh, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. And, and uh, salvation is enormous. It, it, it means, I have, uh, it means uh, someone has to pay for my sins. How do I know whether Jesus paid for all of my sins or not? And so on. And uh, and uh, so we wait upon God, and and uh, we learn that uh, we have to tr and trust this whole matter to God. He has to do all the work of salvation. Thank but thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Go ahead with yes. your call. I was calling um, about Revelation 12. Can you uh, explain that to me? Revelation 12. Uh, which verse are you looking at in Revelation 12? Excuse me? Are you talking about the woman that was clothed with the sun and so on and gave birth to the man-child? Yes, the woman, the woman and dragon from 12 to um, 7. Yeah. Well, you see, the woman is the body of believers. Uh, it is, uh, Christ came out of the body of believers. He, was, he had to have a human nature. Now, true, one woman, Mary, was selected to, uh, to give Christ a human nature, but she was really representative of all the true believers. And... Uh, and uh, then uh, the dragon, that is Satan. That is Satan. And he, uh, uh, the child that the woman gave birth to is the Lord Jesus. And, of course, he wanted to kill the Lord Jesus. And, uh, but remember verse 5 said, She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. After Christ finished his work as Savior, he went back into heaven. And then the woman, the woman continues. Now, this isn't Mary. This is the true believers. Now they're in the New Testament true believers. Uh, and the woman fled into the wilderness. And this world is a wilderness. It is like Israel going from Egypt into the land of Canaan. It is beset by by all kinds of dangers of one kind or another. And without Christ, without the water of the gospel, without the manna, the bread of life, who is the Lord Jesus, it would be a place where we would die spiritually. And, and uh, uh, she, she is, or every true believer is, is in this kind of a spiritual wilderness. And uh, there Christ feeds her. And notice it's for 1,260 days. And that's a figure of speech to indicate the whole New Testament era. Uh, all from the time of Christ all the way until the end of the world. Uh, Christ feeds the true believers with the bread of life. Christ himself is that bread. And as we read the Bible and God applies that to our hearts, uh, we are being fed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it, uh, it talks about uh, uh, how uh, the dragon was driven from heaven. Uh, he was overcome by the, by the uh, blood of Christ and, uh, and so on. Thank All right. You. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing your question. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Campen. Yes. Um, if God is um, choosing the people that he's going to save, the elect, yes. elect, why would God torment man for eternity in hell instead of just killing them and getting it over with? Well, this, this is, of course, uh, a question we can raise. Uh, uh, 
because we didn't make the law, but God's law declared, or first of all, God created man in his image. Uh, there, are, there are certain situations or, there are certain conditions that we have to recognize. Mankind was not created like an animal. An animal has a breath of life, and when the animal dies, he is simply uh, doesn't exist anymore. He, it's as if he had never lived. There's no nothing more left it, to go on. But mankind, and this is true of every single human being, was created to uh, in the image of God. That is, uh, we were created to live forever, and and because God is for. for is uh, goes on forever and and not only that but we were created with a conscience we were created knowing the law of god to some degree god's law is written on our hearts uh, and and because we were created in the image of god god also uh, gave us a law that uh, decreed that as long as we obeyed god everything would be wonderful but if we disobeyed god then there would be an enormous penalty god warned mankind beginning with our first parents adam and eve and we were in their loins and so in principle we were there with them uh, and god warned mankind if you rebel then there will be death and the death that God had in mind was eternal damnation. Now it has to be eternal because man was created to exist, uh, to live eternally. Uh, but And so if he rebelled against God, then instead of being in the highest bliss, in the highest blessing with Christ, uh, he has to be in a place of torment, a place of judgment. Now, how bad that will be, we don't really know. The language of the Bible indicates it is super terrible, and and uh, it's not anything that anyone would want to look forward to at all. And that that penalty has to be assessed against those who rebel. God can is bound by His own laws; He cannot change that. Now, the, um, the really amazing thing, and it's utterly amazing, if I were God and I had created mankind and they had rebelled, I would have thrown everybody into hell forevermore because well, how dare they, how would they dare to rebel against me this way? And I've, I've warned them that there would be this kind of punishment and they didn't listen. Uh, but here... God comes along and he says, you know, there are, there are a number of these people that I want for myself. I want to, uh, to, to uh, have them eternally with me. But he couldn't just take them uh, because they had to go to hell to pay for their sins. They're, they're all sinners. And so it necessitated that God find someone to take these individuals' place in in bearing the wrath of God and no one is qualified except God himself because the wrath of God is so enormous and it's eternally in character and so but in order for God to be the one it meant that he had to be a fellow human he he, uh, it, he couldn't put the put the uh, the sin on an angel the angels aren't the ones that he that that sinned he couldn't put the the burden on the uh, on animals, they had not sinned. It was mankind who had sinned. So it required that a, a uh, someone who is a man, who is a part of the human race, bear the load. And so God himself had to empty himself of his glory, and he did so in the person of the Lord Jesus, and became a human. He became the son of man, as well as remaining the son of God. And thus he was qualified to bear the wrath of God on behalf of those that God came to save. And that is an idea that is way, way beyond anything we can imagine, that would God would so love anyone. And here is this great multitude, which no man can number, that are presently being saved, that God would so love them 
that he would do all of this so that he could have them with him eternally in heaven. Because once Christ paid for their sins, then they're no longer under the wrath of God, and now God is free to forgive them, to make them a new creature, to give them a brand new resurrected soul, and to take them to be with him in the new heaven and the new earth forever. And all of that is, is so glorious and so wonderful. And that's what the message of the Bible is all about. Right. Jesus said he came for the sinner, not the righteous. Well, yes. What, what, how, how, can you explain what that would be? Would the righteous be the elect? Well, you see, the, the okay. Bible says there is none righteous. No, not one. Uh, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But there are those who claim to be righteous. They think they are righteous. They think they have become very good. They, of course, are lying to themselves. They're deceived. And, and when Christ said he came uh, for sinners and not the righteous, he's, he's saying, I, I didn't come for those who are self-righteous, who think they don't need a Savior. I came for sinners, dirty, rotten sinners who know they're sinners and 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 know that they need a savior and uh, and uh, that is the characteristic of a true believer we know that we don't deserve this salvation at all we know that if we're left to ourselves without the uh, atoning work of Christ without the intervention of Christ in our life we would be just as uh, uh, rebellious against God as anybody else but thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello. Yep. Is there a correlation between the booth that Jonah made in Jonah chapter 4, verse 5, and the fig leaves that Adam and Eve sowed in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7? Uh, is there a correlation? Uh, there may be. I, I'm, I'm, I won't be able to answer your question because it's been too long ago since I looked at that closing chapter of the book of Jonah. We do know that there is a correlation between the fig leaf, the, the uh, f uh, fig leaves that Adam and Eve covered themselves with when they were, uh, when they had rebelled against God and the nation of Israel, because the nation of Israel was typified by a fig tree, and their trust was in the nation of Israel, that we have become obedient to God, we are the circumcised one. In other words, they were trusting for a sin covering in, the, in themselves, in the fig leaves, just as uh, Adam and Eve's spirit uh, uh, were trying to cover their physical nakedness with fig leaves in the Garden of Gethsemane, or Garden of Eden. Now, insofar as Jonah uh, and the booth, uh, I, 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 I better not talk about that because I'm going to be speculating, and I don't want to do that. Later. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Good evening. Welcome to Open Hello? Forum. Hello? Yes. Go ahead with your call. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Oh, yes. Uh, Brother Camping, um, I wanted to uh, ask you about the, uh, the sin of blood guilt in the Scripture. The sin of? You say it in, in, in uh, Psalm 51. Yes, the, this, and, and what sin is that in Psalm 51 that you're speaking of? Uh, David said uh, he refers to his blood guilt. Cleanse me from uh, uh, blood guilt. I can't hear you very well. I'm very sorry. Uh, well, I, I, let, let, uh, I can hear you better now. Okay. Uh, we read in uh, Psalm 51, Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Verse 4, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest. Uh, then it goes on, 
Mm, verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Uh, oh, verse 14 is what you're referring to. Deliver me from bloody guiltiness, O, Lord, o God. Thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. Now, incidentally, uh, he was guilty of shedding man's blood. He had actually uh, uh, plotted the murder of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite. And so he was guilty of adultery. He was guilty of murder. And he was a true believer. And he's asking now to be cleansed of all sin, including that sin of murder. And that's a, a very, very serious sin. Uh, uh, and, and, of course, Christ came for sinners, dirty, rotten sinners, who have committed every sin in the book, murder and adultery and thefts and, uh, and lies and, and, and so on and so on, the worship of other gods and uh, sin after sin. Christ came for sinners. And, and uh, here and David, who really is a true believer, yet he recognizes the awfulness of sin, the heinous nature of sin, the fact that this is a terrible, terrible thing that I have done. And it helps us, uh, if we are true believers, if we fall into a sin to take courage, yes, if God would forgive David, he'll forgive us too. We are secure in Christ. But it also helps us to recognize that any sin is serious business. We never, never take the attitude, oh, well, I'm a child of God. All my sins have been paid for. So if I commit this sin, I know it's not quite right what I'm planning to do, but I'll, uh, uh, God, it's all forgiven, hasn't it? been covered by the blood of Christ. And, uh, and uh, no true believer sh should ever have that kind of an attitude because we tremble before the Word of God. We tremble before God. We know that sin should bring eternal damnation. And it's only the mercy of God, only the mercy of God, that he saved any one of us. Not one of us deserves salvation. It, it, maybe you could help me with a distinction here. Uh, David killed many Philistines. He killed many uh, of the enemy, you know, while he was a general or he was under Saul's uh, armies. Um, how, how would you make a distinction, say, between the blood guilt um, uh, as an individual um, slaying an innocent person's blood and then as um, a military man, I mean, we... The, well, the, you, you see, uh, the Bible emphasizes we're not to murder. Uh, when we cut through everything all the way through the Bible, we're not to murder. Yet God has appointed uh, uh, the fact that uh, whoso shed man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. So judges, uh, uh, if the... If, uh, if they're living in a country that wants to be f following the Word of God at all, they would have to appoint judges to make decisions. This man is guilty of taking a man's life, and uh, therefore he is to be killed. As there are areas at times when there is to be killing. Secondly, there are times when God's judgment was to be brought against an enemy, and God could bring or against a people... And God had two ways of doing that. He himself could bring that judgment through pestilence or through fire and brimstone like he reigned on Sodom and Gomorrah or as he did in Noah's day by destroying the whole world with the flood. Or he also sometimes appoints his people to be the executioner because the time has come for God's judgment to be upon them. And uh, that it was true as Israel, for example, fought against the, uh, the uh, sinful uh, nations that were around them. They were commanded by God to do that, not because they were there to murder, but because they were there as executioners, uh, just as, and actually, 
these dreadful events were anticipating or, or, port or were portraits of what it'll be on the last day. On the last day, uh, there will be a death that's way more terrible than physical death. It will be the fact that people will be cast into eternal, uh, into eternal damnation, which is called the second death. And lo and behold, the true believers will be there with Christ uh, engaging in that judgment process and and uh, this is because uh, there there it's not a matter of murder it's a matter of carrying out God's uh, uh, law that declares that there is this kind of punishment that has to be meted out but thank you for calling and sharing and we're going to pause for this message we're continuing with the Open Forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, hello. Yes, I called earlier regarding Ezekiel 37, verse yes. 15 through 17, yes. and I didn't get a chance to ask my question. What is your question? Well, uh, today I spoke with some uh, Mormons. And I tried to explain the verse in Revelation about not adding any books. And then they gave me Ezekiel 37, verse 15 through 17, saying that those are the books from oh, Joseph I... and Judah. And and uh, I don't really know how they got that out of that verse, but they're saying that uh, in Revelation that that passage was written before the books that were written in Judah, I mean, from Judah and from Joseph, known as the Ephraim. Yeah. And I've never read the Book of Mormon, and I was just wondering if you've ever read it just to see what they're talking about. Well, the fact is, uh, I now understand your, the import of your question. You see... I can't hear you. Can you speak louder, please? Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the fact is that, that uh, the uh, Mormon religion, like... Uh, um, the uh, charismatic religion, like the uh, Seventh-day Adventist religion, are, re are religions where they have started with the Bible and then they have added it to the Bible. The Book of Mormon presumably was written by God uh, very recently and, and therefore uh, they believe that it is uh, as great authority because it is an addition to the Word of God. And what they have done is designed a religion or a gospel that has some relationship to the Bible, but actually it is completely man-made. They have... Uh, uh, they have a religion that came out of the mind of men. The Book of Mormon has nothing to do with God at all. Nothing at all to do with God. And they are in violation of Revelation 22, verse 18, where God says if anyone adds to the words of this prophecy or the prophecy of this book, I will add to him the plagues written herein. And uh, therefore, those who are following the Book of Mormon, like those who follow uh, Ellen G. White in, uh, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, or those who follow uh, the uh, popes in the Roman Catholic Church, they are following a gospel that will never, never bring salvation. Uh, they have a, a totally false gospel. And so now what they have done is they've looked at these verses where it talks about Joseph. And, uh, and remember, it was Joseph Smith who was the uh, individual who, who uh, came up with the Book of Mormon uh, and claims he found the golden plates, or however they say it, uh, from which the, bo the Book of Mormon came from. And so uh, they see his name here. Uh, they try to tie that up into his name and and so the whole thing is is simply a, a imaginative out of the minds of men it has no substance in truth at all uh, in order to understand Ezekiel 37 and if we're looking at it because we've read the Book of Mormon we'll never 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 understand it we have to look at Ezekiel 37 only 
in the light of whatever else the Bible teaches. And so don't pay any attention well, I know. to that particular religion. I won't, and I tried to convince them that the Bible was written the way it was written, and you shouldn't try to say that that book was taken out or should be added to or anything like that, but they were pretty convinced. And I was just wondering if he's ever looked at it to see if it's even in the same kind of language. You know, I mean, Bible, I didn't look at it. I was just wondering if he's ever even... The, you, the problem is they are under their authority of their religion. And, uh, and when you say you are only to listen to the Bible, they don't understand that at all. They know, they know, they're utterly convinced that their religion is a true religion. And so you're not going to convince them. You can pray for them because God is the one who has to do the saving. A Mormon uh, or can become saved just as anyone else, but then he'll no longer be following the Book of Mormon at all. He will recognize that it is, uh, it is written by man and has nothing to do with God. And never, never argue with him. The Bible says that uh, if someone comes with another gospel, give them no greeting. Uh, you just uh, uh, present the tr the, what the true gospel is as long as they're willing to listen. And as soon as they begin to offer their gospel, their understanding, you just uh, say, I'm sorry, I have no interest in this, in listening. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Very pleasant to reet you this evening. How are you? Very well, thank you. Go ahead. Good, Brother Camping, uh, I have two verses I would like you to read before I ask my question. Yes. And uh, I can hardly hear you, but I'll speak loud. Second um, Corinthians 4.17 and Second Corinthians 5.17. Second Corinthians 4.17. Second Corinthians 4.17. 17. 417 and 517. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Uh, and then it says in 517, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. Now, uh, the the light affliction that we go through here is the fact that in the world you will have tribulation. We are, af after all, uh, aliens to the normal people of the world. They are still citizens of the kingdom of Satan, and we have uh, uh, left that kingdom and are now uh, citizens of the kingdom of God. And uh, this may be, uh, uh, this is what God has uh, has. Uh, uh, in view for us and and what is going is true that now we suffer affliction we suffer persecution we are slandered we are reviled and so on but it is it is preparing us for a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory when a time comes that we receive our brand new resurrected souls how well wonderful that will be then in second corinthians 5 17 yeah, it, it, it describes what uh, change has happened in us in already we're a new creature not because we have a new body our body didn't change one whit because we became saved but in our soul existence our spirit essence we are a brand new personality and and uh, that is what God is speaking and that is what permits us to uh, be able to withstand and and uh, not revile as we are reviled or not uh, lash out when we are lashed against. It permits us to be able to live in this sin-cursed world uh, because we are, are ready to do it God's way all the way, and we walk very humbly. Sir, may I ask you also to read um, 2 Corinthians 4, I mean 3, 17. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And uh, 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 there is no separation. In, in, on the one hand, the, uh, 
the uh, Bible teaches that there are three persons in the in the Godhead God the Father God the Son God the Holy Spirit on the other hand God teaches that Christ is the Father here God, God is saying that uh, the Lord that is the Lord Jesus is the Spirit and uh, and uh, wherever Christ is or where the Spirit of God is that is wherever God is in our hearts then we have been set at liberty we are uh, liberated from the uh, from the uh, wrath of God we are liberated from the burden of trying to get become right with God because God has made us his child we are liberated from the load of sin that we were carrying we are liberated from the tyranny of Satan wonderful wonderful spiritual things have happened when we became a child of God brother champion um, on the 4th of July you opened your forum with the uh, importance of the liberty of the Spirit of God being more important uh, than the liberty of, of world governments brother champion can you please uh, tell us uh, uh, expound upon this so which is the greater the spreading of democracy and political freedom or the spreading of the gospel of the freedom of truth in Christ Jesus please well the fact is of course mankind tries to make this world as as a good a place as possible in which to live and uh, and uh, so amongst other things they try to uh, form political uh, governments that will be as uh, as uh, beneficial as possible to mankind and that's a, a, a noble a noble thing uh, to work at it's uh, certainly way better than uh, trying to figure out how I can become a despot a dictator how I can rule and uh, uh, and so on and so there is uh, some very good features about that but the problem is all of that is very temporary just because a government uh, becomes a, a a model government uh, that is beneficial or looking out for the rights of each of the citizens of that country that won't do anything at all for the real need of those people namely salvation because those people even though they may have a very beneficial uh, form of government and have uh, much political liberty and freedom they still are under the wrath of God and uh, th they're still going to an have to answer to God on the last day at the judgment throne so they have not been they've been benefited in the short run uh, for a moment they uh, things look better for them but in the long run nothing has changed they're still under the wrath of God and that's why when we are able to publish liberty from our sin liberty from Satan liberty from the wrath of God that is eternal in character that is something that uh, begins right now but it has its full impact for uh, throughout eternity future when we are with the Lord Jesus so really there isn't any comparison at all between the two uh, kinds of liberty the liberty that that we really want to publish and only the true believers have any understanding of this and that is the liberty of being free of our sins and the wrath of God through the Lord Jesus Christ but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, yes. Uh, pleasure to speak with you, uh, Harold Camping. Yes. Uh, Harold, you're a very interesting person. I enjoy listening to uh, this programming very much. And I just want to say, sir, uh, it strikes me as that you have a very puritanical bent to your teachings. Is that correct? A very which? Puritanical. I mean, it seems to me that you're... Are trying to revive a lot of the puritanical teachings. Oh, puritanical is the word you are using. Well, it is true 
that at various times in the history of the of the body of believers they were more closely identified with the truth of the Bible than at other times but but uh, at no time could we say these this people whether it's the Puritans or whether it's the reform uh, reformers uh, of the Reformation or or whatever it is that they had finally found the whole truth when Luther for example uh, began to really preach that just shall live by faith that was a tremendous insight into the Word of God but that was only an insight it wasn't a total understanding of the Word of God and so the the real thing we want to revive is not what the Puritans taught or Martin Luther taught or the reformers taught or Augustine taught or anybody else that we have hold in high regard in the past what we what we want to do is be obedient to God's statement namely to present the whole counsel of God the whole word of God yes. and we don't take lessons from the Puritans we don't take lessons from Martin Luther we take our lessons from the Bible we go right to the Bible well, and stick with the Bible it seemed curious to me because a lot of the things that you say on this program could have come uh, three or four hundred years ago in the uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony or somewhere in Pennsylvania or in Virginia because you you are opposed to uh, secular music, you're opposed to alcohol in any amount at any time, you're opposed to music or dancing or any forms of entertainment, and this is comes right from the Puritan agenda well, that came over see, from the Mayflower. So that's why I'm putting the connection between the two, sir. Well, the reason is is that they had the same Bible that we have, the Bible that they used was no different than the Bible that we that we use. The Bible hasn't been changed. It's well, only true, that, know, sir, it's only one, that one as we've been going that, on in our nation uh, and, and as the world has been going on, uh, the Bible is uh, most of the time never paid attention to. Mankind uh, searches his own mind and, and his own philosophies as to how am I to live, how am I to enjoy life, how am I to, uh, what are what are to be my aspirations and my goals and so on. And uh, then, of course, it, it can go in every kind of a direction. It can go into very false religions. It can go in the direction of uh, atheism. It can go in the direction uh, in a lot of different ways. But if we have the same authority, and the Puritans didn't have any different authority than we have, or we don't have any different authority than they have. And so, of course, there are going to be similarities. God laid uh, certain uh, uh, truths upon their hearts, which they, which they wanted to teach. Uh, the difference is that maybe they were trying, I, I think uh, that they were trying to make the whole society follow the law of God, uh, that is set up a morality for the whole society that would fit the, the Word of God. And we know, of course, that that will never work because man is in rebellion against the Word of God. Only those who are true believers will have any understanding of that kind of biblical morality. And, and in our day, we're not teaching that we would be happy if the whole world would... Uh, would uh, the stop drinking alcohol. Uh, that's, well, that know, has the, nothing the to do with the gospel. As I, see it, I think a good example, uh, as way, by way of illustration, since this was uh, July 4th, was just a couple of days ago, uh, I wonder if you're aware, sir, that uh, George Washington and the Puritans did not get along. Do you know, for instance, that the Puritans were not in favor of the American Revolution? And do you know that George Washington... Uh, continuously uh, level charges of sedition against Puritan preachers because in their sermons, their weekly sermons, they condemned the American Revolution and George Washington had to threaten imprisonment unless they stopped. Well, you know, if that is true, and I, and I could well believe that it was true, uh, it is true that there one can raise serious questions about the, the, uh, the right 
of the colonists to rebel against England because the Bible tells us that every government is is uh, is uh, put in place by God. God raises up rulers and puts down rulers, and the Puritans understood that. that the, that's what the Bible teaches. Now it turns out that even though that rule of the Bible was violated, and uh, the consequence is that the United States became a, a an independent nation. Uh, it, it, you can't justify that from the Bible, that they became an in, independent nation. Uh, according to the strict understanding of the Bible, that was contrary to the Word of God. Exactly. However, God sometimes, and in this instance it certainly is true, sometimes He allows certain violations to take place because God has a larger plan. And in that larger plan, He will utilize uh, the sins of those that are, will fit into that plan. Uh, and and uh, the larger plan was that because the United States became independent of England, they were able to set up a, a different form of government than England had. They were able to really establish freedom of or separation of church and state, which is very, very wonderful, uh, so that today we are much, much more at ease in speaking about uh, Bible things in the United States than we can in most other countries. There, there's no other country that but we can know, have as problem, much freedom as we. Now, it started out as a rebellion against God's law, but God allowed it so that through this it became a tremendous blessing. It's parallel, I would say, for example, to the, the uh, brothers of Joseph. They hated Joseph with a passion. He's their young brother, 17 years old, and they wanted him killed. Finally, in, uh, in a cruel act of hatred, they sold him as a slave, which was a terrible thing to do. And, and yet God turned it all around. That's, that the outcome of all this was that Joseph became the prime minister of Egypt, second only to the Pharaoh, and became a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as he saved uh, the, his brothers from, from physical starvation, and so on, and so on. And uh, that is not unlike what happened here in the United States. The well, Puritans sir. were probably spiritually on target, but God overruled that in order, or uh, did not, uh, allowed the, those who had other voices to, to gain the ascendancy, and uh, who are who did not understand the, that biblical rule from the Bible, because God had in view uh, to build a nation that was quite different than England. Well, don't you, sir? I have a lot of respect for you, but don't you think, sir, that you are aligning yourself with the forces of regression because of your literal beliefs regarding the Bible? Now I know you're going to tell me that you are faithful to the Word of God, and I believe you, sir. I know that you are, and everyone should know that you are dedicated and faithful to the Word of God. But don't you feel that you are aligning yourself with the, with uh, forces that would, would uh, cause regression rather than the forces to make, pro to make greater progress in this world? You know, as a matter of fact, the opposite is true. The opposite is true. Uh, the the uh, more we are in the Bible and trusting the Bible, that is the way there is going to be progress made, not as we are in in uh, in uh, opposing the Bible. For well, example, for example, I, I have said this again and again because I'm very interested in scientific matters. If our scientists today would start out with the Bible, trusting that the Bible was true, uh, they wouldn't be wasting all their money trying to prove that mankind is out in deep space. They're just wasting that money. They haven't found one spid smidgen of evidence that, that there's life out there, and the Bible doesn't give any encouragement that there's life out there, and yet they've spent billions of dollars on that. When they uh, when they are talking about uh, you think of all these fine scientific minds that are puzzling about whether the world started out with a big bang or whether it was 13 billion years old or whatever it may be if they would only trust the Bible 
they would stop wasting all of that time and all of that fine in intellectual energy and they could go on and, and do a lot more things. You know, it's very significant that the scientific revolution began about the time of the writing of uh, the uh, uh, printing press and the writing of the King James Bible because it was in the in the year 1600 uh, that men like uh, like uh, 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 Boyle and uh, Isaac Newton and so on lived who were really beginning to understand what an element was and beginning to understand uh, some of the of the laws of that are now uh, ex accepted scientific laws and they were making real good progress but most of these men were also very very deep students of the bible they they trusted the bible all together and and uh, it's from there that uh, that after after uh, uh, almost 13,000 years of history uh, suddenly mankind began to know a lot of things scientifically that had never been known before but they came by from the minds of dedicated students of the Bible yeah, I and I believe all this matter of evolution for example which is uh, all that atheism is just a, an enormous hindrance to the development of truth. Uh, well, I think you can be in favor of truth. I think I am in favor of reading scriptures. I read scriptures. I don't think uh, that people should stop reading the Bible. My problem is that in view of discovery today, and I'm not talking about the natural science. If you don't mind, let me give you one example of archaeology. Sir, can you tell me that you have one shred of evidence outside of the Bible that can prove that the Israelites were in Egypt now, the Egyptologists, and I am a student of uh, Egyptian history, I have to tell you that, and e Egyptologists today can read the writings on the walls of the pyramids, on the temples, above ground and underground. They can read the writing, the hieroglyphics of ancient Egypt as easily as they can read the Monday morning paper. Now, what I'm t trying to tell you is they, they have come up with no evidence to indicate that the Israelites ever lived in Egypt, nor were they ever slaves in Egypt. That goes against, yeah, that is well, contrary. Uh, we're almost to the end of our program. I, I want to explain something. You know, again and again, it can be shown that uh, kings came to the throne who did not want to have left a record of disaster. And you can rest assured that every reference to the Israelites and that enormous disaster that came to Egypt, all of those statements were, were obliterated so that they could not be read by later people. And I can give you other illustrations of that. And the Bible is the only true history. But I can also tell you something about the Egyptian a king who ruled at that time, and but I, we don't have time. Right now we have to say goodnight. Okay, thank you. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.